After the first derivative, the second derivative is the most commonly observed. Let's go over a few examples where the second derivative appears very naturally. The first that you've probably already thought of is acceleration. If you think of a moving body, the acceleration is the second derivative of its position with respect to time. So if the position is given by x as a function of time t, then the acceleration is d squared x dt squared. Now, you've got a real visceral intuition for this. Things like projectiles that you throw up in the air, bouncing balls, moving vehicles, all that kind of stuff. Acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. Now, recall that if we think about the position, velocity, acceleration of a body, there's a formula, maybe familiar from your physics class, that you should remember. If you've got a body with initial position, velocity, and acceleration, then the position, x, as a function of time t, can be written as x0, the initial position, plus v0 t, where v0 is the initial velocity. And then what comes next? Well, it's 1 half at squared, right? But really, a0 times t squared, where a0 is the initial acceleration. Now, often in physics class, we assume acceleration is constant, but what if it's not? Well then, we have, for small values of t, some higher order terms which are not that significant. We can put them all in a big O t cubed trash can. In which case, we look at this and say, hey, this is just the Taylor series. And the initial position, the initial velocity, those are related to the zeroth order and first order terms respectively. Why is there that one half in front of the at squared? That's really one over two factorial, because this is the second order term in the Taylor series of position. Okay, so that's a second derivative interpreted in terms of acceleration. But there are other interpretations as well. You can get a lot of second derivatives in geometry, especially when you consider the notion of curvature. Let's consider a curve, a smooth curve in the plane. The curvature is how much that curve is turning or twisting. Maybe it's sort of related to acceleration. Hmm. A better, more precise definition is that the curvature is the inverse of the radius of the best fit circle. What do I mean by that? If you consider a point on that curve, we know what the tangent line means, right? Right. Well, what if instead of approximating to first order, we approximate to second order, not with a parabola, but with a circle, a best fit circle whose first and second derivatives match those along the curve. Then, in this case, the curvature kappa is 1 over the radius, capital R, of that best fit circle. Now, as you change the point on your curve, you can see how the circle changes its radius. When the radius is really small, that's high curvature. When the radius is really large, that's very small curvature even to the point where that radius is going to infinity and the curvature goes to zero. In the particular case where the curve that we're looking at is really the graph of a function, y equals f of x, then there's an explicit formula for curvature kappa as a function of x. It's given by the absolute value of the second derivative of f divided by quantity one plus the first derivative squared all to the three halves power. That's kind of a complicated formula. You don't need to know it. It's a real pain to derive. But what it captures is that the curvature is related to the first and second derivatives. If we think about that context where we have a function y equals f of x, then based on that formula, at the maxima and minima, at the peaks and the troughs, what the curvature is really giving you is the absolute value of the second derivative.
Now, it's a little bit more complicated when you move away from those maxima or minima, but that formula can help with understanding that. Now, notice the use of the absolute value. Curvature is always going to be non-negative the way that we've presented it, but the sign of the second derivative, whether it's positive, whether it's negative, that has meaning too. That is meaning in terms of convexity. You may remember this from when you first learned calculus. In regions where the second derivative is positive, then we say that the graph of the function is concave up. In regions where the second derivative is negative, we say that it's concave down. And at those particular points where the second derivative vanishes, those are places where the curvature is zero. Now there's more to second derivatives than just curvature and convexity. Consider the phenomenon of waves. Second derivatives are really what make the motion of waves do what they do over and over periodically. This is implicit in something called the wave equation, which is not a part of our story, but which you may see some day. Besides the physical sorts of waves, water waves, sound waves, that you're used to thinking of, the second derivative is related to a different type of wave, an oscillation, something that is driving a periodic behavior or phenomenon, like the motion of a simple pendulum. The second derivative is really behind a lot of periodic behaviors in physical systems, biological systems, and it is an integral part of the construction of periodic functions, functions like sine and cosine. These functions in their very definitions are really related to the second derivative. We'll have more to say about that later in our story.